This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. Hold on to your steering wheel as we're about to hit the road on this week's PreserveCast as we talk with Evans Paul about Baltimore's Stop the Road movement, the historic waterfront community saved, and the highway to nowhere. Detailed in his recently released book, Stop the Road, Stories from the Trenches of Baltimore's Road Wars, Paul will give us a glimpse into the up-close and personal account of Baltimore's 40-year battle over highway plans. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Today, we're excited to be joined by Evans Paul, who is both a city planner and author of a recently released book, Stop the Road, Stories from the Trenches of Baltimore's Road Wars, um, which obviously has a huge preservation component to it. Um, So we're excited to be talking with him right here in our backyard as PreserveCast is recorded in Maryland. Um, So Evans, let's, let's talk a little bit about sort of your path into all of this kind of work. Where'd you grow up and how does one become a city planner? And and then we'll get into the road book, but let's talk about your day job here first. Okay, cool. Sure. Um, So I grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia, um, which which incidentally was the uh, original uh, destination of the B&O Railroad. Uh, So I have this sort of uh, interesting connection from Baltimore to, to Wheeling and uh, and one of my taglines in writing the Road Wars saga is that um, I think the the uh, the Road Wars are basically the most significant controversy and decisions that were made in Baltimore since the building of the B&O Railroad. Um, uh, so. Uh, that's what really attracted me to this topic that was was the significance of it and that it was kind of an untold story but you asked uh, about how i became a city planner i got a masters in city planning uh at university of of uh, illinois at champaign urbana uh and then came to baltimore uh, in 1973, shortly after getting my degree. So you were there almost contemporaneously with with some aspects of of the road wars. Um, so mm-hmm. you, you saw you saw this firsthand, and it's interesting because it's I, I was excited to be able to get a chance to interview you because the road wars, particularly in the preservation community, are almost like apocryphal. Like there's all these different stories and aspects and. Was this person really involved or did they make it for a political play later on and say that they were involved? So I'm, I'm excited to kind of talk about this. So the book, again, for those listening um, who are interested in these in these aspects of sort of urban decisions of the 20th century and, and how obviously it impacted historic communities is called Stop the Road, Stories from the Trenches of Baltimore's Road Wars. So let's let's kind of deep dive into this a little bit and obviously we're going to encourage folks to pick up the book and a link to buy the book will be in the show notes um but g- give some background on this stop the road movement and maybe even before we get there <laughs> what were they trying to stop you know let's 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 kind of roll back time to mid 20th century baltimore what was on the table and then we'll talk about the effort to stop it okay all right so uh there were three highway plans uh, for for Baltimore. Uh, I ninety five coming in from the southwest, I seventy coming in through the west, and I eighty three being extended from its current location where it uh, where it leaves off at Fayette Street and is supposed to be extended through what's now Inner Harbor East, uh, then Fells Point and Canton. And uh, somewhat incredibly, the uh, activists, the outsiders, if you will, those who um, really had no clout, were able to prevail in in most of the decisions for all three uh, of those highway segments. And um, you know, I, I, sometimes I'm, I read my own words, and and I'm you know I got sort of can't believe that this actually happened how often is it that the that the activists and the outsiders are able to pre- prevail over the political and economic power structure 
Um, but the, the highway, there were three of the three highways. One was moved. That was I-95, um, which was going to enter Baltimore roughly, uh, where it does now, but then it was going to veer in a northeasterly direction, uh, across South Baltimore at Montgomery Street, um, take out a corner of Federal Hill Park, cross the Inner Harbor on a 14-lane bridge, and then intersect. <laughs> yeah, 14 <laughs> lanes, uh, and then intersect with I-83 in what's now Harbor East. Um, uh, and so that highway was moved south to the Fort McHenry alignment, and that was you know, the first amazing victory um, and, and one that I find especially interesting because it, it pitted architects and planners against engineers and the political establishment. Um, uh, and then uh, the I-70 I was partially defeated. It, it was supposed to come through Leakin Park it, uh, remember, it terminates now just outside the city, uh, a, a little ways east of the Beltway. It has that odd turnaround there for the park and ride. That's where it was supposed to go through Leakin Park and then the African-American communities uh, of Rosemont and Harlem Park. Um, and the one... Uh, completely embarrassing uh, part of the highway that did get built was the highway to nowhere. Um, but the rest of the segment was dropped in, in 1980. And then uh, the third highway that was defeated was uh, I-83, the extension through uh, Southeast Baltimore, what's now Harbor East, Fells Point and Canton. Um, um, so, uh, kind of going three for three against the political power structure. I, I was really attracted to telling that story uh, and and it led me to to uh, so many interesting people and and so many interesting stories that um, that that's that became the core of the Road Wars book. So for people listening around the country, um, you know that maybe they pull out a map, they look at seeing the roads that you talked about and, and how they are, how are they stopped. And there's the nuts and bolts of that and how it impacts Baltimore. But in a broader sense, how, how did they win? Right. And I know that that's a big question and that's what the book gets into, but in so many communities, they were just steamrolled bulldozed literally over and just couldn't stop them. Even in communities here in Maryland, I mean, you look at like Cumberland, Maryland on a small scale where the road goes right through downtown um mm -hmm. how and there's so many examples obviously across the country of this how were they successful where others failed what is there a secret sauce to what was happening in baltimore um well uh i i i think it all kind of came together in about 1966 and 67 uh, up up until that time, uh, the highway opponents were primarily in neighborhood organizations trying to protect their own turf. And around 1966 and 67, organizations uh, started to be formed for the express purpose of fighting the, the highways. Um, uh, the first was the Relocation Action Movement, which was a coalition of African American organizations on the West Side. Um, the second was the Society for the Preservation of, Fels, of Federal Hill and Fells Point, um, uh, which you know it has a much larger role now, but at the time was created for the sole purpose of fighting against the highways. Um, and then the organization that Barbara Mikulski started, the Southeast Council Against the Road, um, uh, kind of was a, was a good counterpart to the Preservation Society. Um, the, the preservationists um, were vulnerable to the argument that they were sort of elitists and not necessarily representative of the neighborhoods and Mikulski's 
uh, Southeast Council Against the Road, um, uh, involved all the white ethnics and really pulled uh, the rest of Southeast Baltimore into uh, the road fight with the preservationists. Uh, and then in 1968, um, all those groups came together to form the movement against destruction. Um, uh, so we finally had a citywide activist group that uh, that was fighting a- against the highways and and um, movement against destruction. Uh, Mad um, was an interesting group because uh, they uh, they they gained a lot of expertise and and were able to kind of go toe to toe with the engineers. And, uh, and so getting back to your original question, finally, <laughs> how, how, how did the Baltimore highway opponents prevail? Um, uh, I, I think it was because uh, they threw, between all these organizations, they threw so many obstacles at, at, at the highways uh, and and the highway planners were forced to accommodate uh, very expensive uh, changes to the highway system, which later proved to be beyond the city's ability to to finance. Um, uh, so they were able to engineer delay after delay, um, and uh, and then all these changes and. And the delays uh, factored in it, it very prominently because uh, because time is money. And in the late in from the mid to late 1970s, where, that was a very uh, uh, that was a time of very high interest rates and very high inflation. So uh, highway cost estimates that were made in 1974 were sometimes doubling and tripling four years later. Uh, so all those delays um, were part of the key to why the highway system became too expensive for the city to afford. It's interesting because there's so many parallels. And I mean, obviously, we're talking here in Maryland. There's people listening all across the country. But, you know, in in Maryland, we're still there are still highway fights. There's a highway fight going on right now um, on the Washington, D.C. Beltway that's going to impact historic resources and African-American cemeteries. And there's a fight. And think about the parallels, too. We're in a period of increasing interest rates and high inflation. And, you know, delaying these decisions could end up stymieing the expansion. So kind of looking at the playbook of what happened in Baltimore can be helpful for people who are trying to stop, you know, misguided uh, road expansions and things like that. I'm curious as a as a city planner, um, did the did this movement and, you know, you, you mentioned you came to Baltimore in 73. Did how did you perceive what was going on at the time and have had had your opinions of it changed over time did you think it was the right thing at the time I mean I'm I'm asking you to kind of be introspective here but at the time were you like no this is good for Baltimore Uh, but now I mean how did how did you as a city planner evolve along with this yeah okay so uh so if I could back up a, a little bit on that question. Um, so I, I came out of uh, planning school in 1973. And in the late 1960s and 1970s, early 1970s, there was an upheaval in city planning uh, that paralleled the upheavals that were affecting pretty much every other segment of society. Um, and in city planning, um uh there was a lot of questioning of the, our role in serving the interests of the of those who were already in power and whether there were many disenfranchised communities that were kind of being left out of that um and uh prominent in in that reconsideration of what our role is was uh, a, a kind of new theory of advocacy planning. Now, I, I was not a, an advocate planner, planner, if you will. Um, I was a generalist planner, and uh, 
and and I did have uh, you know very strong feelings uh, uh, that city planning needs to be more responsive to uh, those who have largely been left out of the process in, in the past. Um, but my job um, was, you know, be, be really a conventional planning job. I was I was not involved in the highway battles directly. Um, but I mentioned a- advocacy planning um, because uh, there was there were a couple of folks that were involved in a consulting team called the Urban Design Concept Team uh, who were the embodiment of advocacy planning. And um, uh, one of the stories that I, um, my jaw still drops open when I read, when I read my own words is the manner in which the urban design concept team um, worked actively against the interests, the interests of their clients uh, their clients, the, the city state oversight team, the interstate division of Baltimore City and the state uh, roads commission um, were all in favor of that highway that would have gone through Federal Hill, Montgomery Street, across the Inner Harbor Bridge uh, and 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 then the intersection uh, at at uh, I-83 with Harbor East. and. Um, uh, and the manner in which they got that decision changed is just the most amazing uh, example of of a consulting team actively working against the interests of their clients that that I have ever experienced or read about or uh, uh, or heard about. Um, and part of that relates to a guy named Stu Bryant. Uh, who was um, a a product of UC Berkeley and was active in the free speech movement. Um, So he had a a very liberal left point of view. Um, And uh, he saw his role as providing information to the community, whether his overseers thought that was appropriate or not. Um, and after there was a, uh, an unfavorable decision on one of their recommendations it had to do with the Rosemont segment, um, he started really actively working against the interests of his, the, uh, over his overseers. Uh, he was, um, uh, working with the anti-highway coalition, helping them write their position papers, school, schooling them on how to, uh, you know, wh- where the weak points were in the environmental impact statements. Um, and he got fired or re- reassigned several different times, but then he was he was always brought back because it was an, a public embarrassment <laughs> and, and he had a constituency in these communities who had gotten used to uh, getting information that they were not supposed to get. So, so I'm, 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 I'm I veered away from your from your question considerably here, but I, I think it's uh, you know it was just a, a really interesting time that I came out of school and uh, and the whole planning profession was uh, being turned upside down, and and the road wars were kind of a case in point. Why don't we take a quick break here, come back, and then talk about. You know, we talked a lot about what they got right and what they stopped, but maybe what they stopped short of getting right um, and where all this is now and, and what you're working on um, next. And we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Historic preservation can't happen without skilled tradespeople to perform the work. And there's a critical need right now for those tradespeople. The Campaign for Historic Trades, powered by Preservation Maryland, is working to meet that need by strengthening apprenticeship opportunities within historic trades. In partnership with the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center and Conservation Legacy, the campaign is currently recruiting for NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, or TTAP. TTAP is an intensive 20-week apprenticeship that provides young adults 
the chance to learn historic trade skills while working on America's most iconic historic sites. Multiple positions are open for the 2022 season at national parks across the country. Visit historictrades.org for more information on TTAP and how to apply today. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. We're back talking with Evans Paul, um, and we've been talking all about his new book, Stop the Road, Stories from the Trenches of Baltimore's Road Wars. We've been talking about how Baltimore got it right and how they were able to stop it and sort of the unique situation that they found themselves in and were able to prevent this, this massive road expansion where so many other communities had failed. Do you feel that there was any sort of like missed opportunities, though? I mean, I, I for me, you know, I'm not trying to lead the the answer here, but like the glaring missed opportunity is okay. We didn't build the road, but we also didn't put in any real substantive public transit infrastructure that we missed that, and that Baltimore has has suffered as a result of that. There was a big public infrastructure plan or transit plan as well, and that wasn't really ever fully built out. What happened there was it because the effort really was more stopping things. It was harder to get them. To build that, did that not come along because of the the road not coming? What what, what happened with transit? Well, well, this this really gets to uh, Mayor William Donald Schaefer's blind spot. Uh, Schaefer um, was the, the the top advocate uh, for the highway system going back to his role in city council and then the city council president. And then when he, when he was elected mayor in 1972, uh, he saw his job as to get the highways built. Um, and, uh, and, and everyone who was standing in the way of that was his opponent. And, uh, and they kind of worked and, and he regarded them as his enemies, and he, he did a lot to denigrate the leaders of the anti-highway coalition. Um, but uh, uh, Schaefer, starting starting in 1973, uh, in 1973, Congress uh, adopted amendments to what's called the Highway Trust Fund to allow cities to use highway funds for transit instead. And uh, just to our south in Washington, D.C., that's exactly what they did. They they shifted a billion dollars uh, from building highways to uh, building their metro system. And uh, it was a huge boost to the metro system. Of course, the metro system needed more than one billion, but that was uh, um, that was a huge change for them. Um, By comparison, Baltimore, because Schaefer was, you know, lock, stock and barrel all in for the highways, uh, Schaefer would not entertain any discussion of shifting those funds to, to transit. So none. I mean, he wouldn't entertain shifting any of it. Uh, no, not until it became apparent in 1980 that he, he couldn't afford the highways. Um, um, and and by 1980, see the, the the opportune time to do this was 1973 to 1976. That's the time when we had the gas crisis, the oil the the, the oil crisis. Um, and uh, you know everyone was really focused on mass transit as uh, an alternative to highways. Um, the The highway trust had been broken, allowed cities to shift funds to transit. Um, uh, in 1976, that legislation was changed to allow cities to shift funds not only to transit but also to local streets. So. Uh, so, and then uh, in 1980 and 1980 to 83, when the city did finally trade in their highway dollars, uh, by by then um, the city had neglected its streets for 
a decade and the streets were falling apart and neighborhoods were clamoring, clamoring for the streets to be resurfaced much more than, than for mass transit. We did end up shifting, uh, I believe it was around 300 million to transit, but that was 300 million of 1.1 billion. So it was a whole lot less than what, for example, Washington uh, did in a parallel situation in 1976. Um, so in a way, does the the road war, the fight over it, and the insistence of leaders like Schaefer to go in that direction, is the one of the direct results of that the challenging public transportation system that we have because they because they were so unwilling to shift that money, they kind of left it on the table hoping they'd build these roads and then by the time they couldn't build them, then they couldn't build transit either. Yeah, by that by then, well, the and inflation had 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 uh, kind of ruined the the um, the ability of the city to finance a good subway system. Um, um, but uh, the, uh, the the metro system was just kind of given lip service by by Schaefer and by the, the state. You know, there was an adopted plan, but there wasn't much money going into it. And then, and then, yeah, as as I said, when they finally made the decisions on what to do with the highway funds. It kind of got sprinkled all around. Uh, it even went to uh, Interstate 68, which at the time was called the National Freeway. Um, and uh, you know, there's a whole interesting story behind that because it factors into Schaefer running for governor in uh, in 1986. Yeah, and we're still building roads to nowhere. There's a I don't know if you're familiar with the U.S. Route 219, a road that goes from Cumberland north that the state has spent a significant amount of money on. And it connects basically to nothing. So we, we still like building roads. There's there's something something great about road building. Um, and it's, you know, something that the preservation community ha obviously has to pay attention to because it, it's so intrinsically connected to historic resources, both above and below ground. Um, so we're still dealing with the the ramifications of this this road war today what's the what's the postscript on the book what do you what do you feel about um about all of this is was it you know obviously stopping the roads good the result of its impact on transit not so good um getting around baltimore still challenging because of all of these things right you don't have the roads but you don't have the transit you, it's it's yeah. sort of a it's sort of a, a a bad bad situation how do we how do we get ourselves out of it if you have the the magic wand to fix baltimore's transportation issues how would you actually do it oh well you you've put me in a position uh, that uh, i'm I'm not really accustomed to being made. You just made me czar of transportation, but, um, um, we well, wrote the book on it. So <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think the red line was a huge missed opportunity. And for people who around the country who don't know, that was a, that was a, uh, subway and above ground transit system that would have gone to the West of Baltimore and, and most of the, the traditionally African-American communities. If, if Schaefer would have been open-minded to shifting highway funds to transit back in 1973 to 1976, um, they, there could have been a, uh, a really good uh, early version of the red line. Remember the, the two highway alignments that were dropped were I-70 through West Baltimore and I-83 through, 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 through Southeast Baltimore, which roughly followed the same corridor as the later right. proposal for the red line. Um, so it, if serious planning had been done for that line based on the possible contingency of Congress adopting this bust the trust um, uh, movement, um, uh, an early version of the red line uh, 
could have been the trade-in for the dropped highway funds. Uh, and I think it would have made a huge difference to West Baltimore. Uh, it would have made a huge difference to, to Baltimore in general because uh, you know, transit has a centralizing effect on land use and, and density, whereas highways have a decentralizing effect on land use and, and growth. Um, but in, in West Baltimore in particular, um, uh, one of the things that one of the things that is really lacking is transportation to suburban jobs. So, right. uh, um, I mean, the trans a, a, a good transit system would have bolstered downtown Baltimore as a job center, um, but uh, that probably wouldn't have stopped the decentralization of jobs to the to the suburbs. Um, and uh, there are huge uh, obstacles to people getting uh, from these inner city neighborhoods like West Baltimore, um, Harlem Park, and so on, uh, to those suburban job centers. And and if an early version of the red line were built, uh, a, a lot of that problem could have been solved with access to Woodlawn on the west side and uh, and on the east side over toward the industrial centers, um, and then linking up with the later built the uh, later built um, uh, North Central line, pr- therefore uh, providing access to Hunt, the Hunt Valley Job Center and the airport job center. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it could have been a huge difference maker for, for West Baltimore. So, I mean, I think for the preservationists listening, the, the value in this conversation is sort of thinking through. I mean, obviously, these transportation projects not only would have benefited the communities, but obviously also, I mean, there's rich historic fabric all throughout those areas um, that have a better chance of being invested in, taken care of, restored if their people can get in and out of those communities and, and the, the transportation desert that it is um, directly impacts those historic resources. So fascinating conversation. And it's also interesting as a Marylander and there's so much, uh, you know, worship of William Donald Schaefer to hear, um, you know, obviously there's, there's some, a lot of important counterpoints to that, but this is one that doesn't come up as much. Um, and I think, um, is important to remember as people kind of think about his legacy as as both mayor and, and governor. Um, what are you working on next? Uh, what what's the what's the next story you're going to tell? <laughs> oh well, uh, it, when I when I retired in I don't know roughly my, uh, 2017 2018, and my business kind of ebbed ebbed away, and I started writing the book. Uh, it didn't seem like much of a retirement because I shifted right from uh, working full time to writing full time. Um, uh, so now I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of really retire and, uh, I've got one grandson and three kids and, and, uh, uh, you know, I do all those things, uh, do some traveling, um, you know, may, maybe write a baseball blog. I, I, I don't, I don't know that there's anything else that I'm going to be doing in the city planning area. Well, we'll keep an eye out in case you are, and we will um, put a link in the show notes to the book so that people can pick it up. Um, Definitely a good read for anybody interested in preservation and uh, community planning and advocacy and how you stop bad ideas and how that all plays out in a community um, as diverse and complicated and beautiful as Baltimore. Um, Thanks for joining us today, Evans. It was great to have you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.